Welcome back to Strange Resort, the podcast that lurks in the shadows of otherwise sunny vacation destinations. I am your host, George Hatfield, and today I am surrounded by a breathtaking view of the Rocky Mountains. I'm standing on a platform, I'm right at the railing, looking over the edge at a sharp drop that would definitely break my neck, but I am going to ignore the call of the void, at least for now, and I am currently gazing at the small town of Sidewinder, way, way down in the valley, about 40 miles away. The platform where I'm standing, this is called the Roof O the World, not of the world, O apostrophe world. Very folksy. It was built by the Colorado State Park Services after they cleared away the charred ruins of a once beautiful resort known as the Overlook Hotel, our subject for today's episode. Now, if you've listened to this podcast before, then you know I normally check into a nice hotel and stay the weekend and pamper myself and try my best to uncover the hotel's sordid little history, but this episode is going to be different. First, because the hotel in question no longer exists, and second, because this episode is personal. I'm now walking down the steps, away from the roof of the world, headed to the Overlook Lodge and gift shop, which is next to the Bluebell Camping Grounds. I am seriously out of shape, but here we are at the bottom, and I am looking at a plaque set into the granite stone, and it reads, This was once the site of the Overlook Hotel, built in 1907, destroyed in 1975. It's a bright warm day, blue skies, gentle breeze, the perfect picnic weather, my mother would have said. And yet there's something off-putting about this location. I have to admit that more than once I've been standing here trying to think of the next thing to say, and I've felt this feeling like there was someone right behind me even though there's there's nobody else up here but before we deal with the present let's look back at the past the overlook hotel began construction in 1907 it was the lifelong dream of a man named robert townley watson and it was designed to be a beacon of luxury set against the granite skyline of the rockies it was a massive undertaking of engineering, costing millions of dollars and employing hundreds of workers. It was finished in 1909, on schedule, and that's about the only success that you will find connected to this infamous hotel. It would become a landmark that would attract starlets and politicians, moguls and mobsters, and let's not forget murderers. In its glory days, the Overlook was magnificent. Palatial, topiary gardens, a roque court that's sort of like croquet, but for rich people. It was complete with awe-inspiring views of nature at every turn. Despite the marvels of this destination hotel, the location was an inherent weakness. Why? because of winter. Up here in the Rocky Mountains, snow arrives early, sometimes in September, and lasts for a long time. To quote Prince, sometimes it snows in April. There's only one road from town that brings you to this location, 
and it becomes inaccessible as soon as ice and snow come into the equation. That meant that the owner, Robert Watson, could only keep his beloved hotel open for five to six months out of the year. The construction was a dream come true for Watson, but the running of the hotel became a business nightmare, and in 1915, Watson sold the hotel at a severe loss. This ultimately crippled any future business pursuits, and instead of leaving behind a legacy for Watson's children, many of them became employees of the hotel, including his grandson, Bill Watson, who became the Overlook's maintenance man for over 30 years. I've been spending a lot of time in the Sidewinder Museum and looking at the old photos of this majestic building, it's easy to see its charms. There were 110 rooms, including 30 suites, and the largest of which was aptly named the Presidential Suite. Over the years, the Overlook had four presidents as guests, including FDR and Richard Nixon. There are photos of a beautiful banquet hall known as the Colorado Lounge, which must have been the ultimate spot to have a party in the 1920s. Yet still, the Overlook passed from one unfortunate owner to the next, never making a profit. The guest book was most likely destroyed in the fire, but according to some of the old timers at the Sidewinder Cafe, famous guests include Clark Gable, Gene Harlow, John D. Rockefeller, and Henry Ford. Eventually, the hotel was purchased by one of the richest men in America, Horace Derwent. Derwent was a cunning entrepreneur, comfortable in Hollywood circles, as well as the underground criminal world that governed Vegas and the East Coast. Derwent was born shortly after the turn of the century in St. Paul, Minnesota. As a young man, he dropped out of high school and joined the Navy. He had a knack for inventing just about anything from propeller designs to a strapless bra. He had the Midas touch with everything except the Overlook Hotel. Despite all of his connections and lavish parties, even he could not get the Overlook to turn a profit. But perhaps he was rich enough he didn't care. His interest in the hotel might have been more about status. According to local rumor, Derwent would host costume parties of the Eyes Wide Shut variety. Guests would arrive masked and stay the entire evening and when the chimes struck midnight, supposedly, everyone would unmask and undress. The turnkey is here, if you want to try to use it. Speaking of chimes, I'm in the Sidewinder Museum of the Rockies, standing with Janice Edmonds, the museum's only curator. She's showing me an old clock of the cuckoo variety. When we wind it up, little people dance about. Oh, that's adorable. Just wait. And then something perverted happens. Oh, okay. Uh, so what I'm looking at are two ceramic figurines copulating, I guess you could say. You could call it that. And was there a big demand for X-rated cuckoo clocks? I wouldn't say demand, but Mr. Derwitt had certain tastes. These tastes would include an interest in what one might describe as an early version of the furry community. Harry, as his friends called him, was known for wearing a fox mask at his masked balls. And during the 1940s, he palled around with a man known only as Roger. For a brief time, the two were inseparable. According to the Hollywood gossip, the two men had a love affair while vacationing in Cuba. On August 29, 1945, Derwent hosted his most extravagant party ever. Think Great Gatsby, but with a higher altitude. His companion, Roger, was desperate for Horace's attention. So the night of the party, Roger dressed as a dog, not just wearing a mask, but an entire dog outfit. Collar, paws, fur, tail, everything. According to Cary Grant, quote, it was one of the strangest things I'd ever seen. 
Harry was taunting a full-grown man dressed in a silvery dog outfit, making him sit up, beg, bark, chase his tail. It was funny at first, but then it became intolerable. I'm back in the Sidewinder Museum and Janice is showing me a container in her back office. It is filled with different remnants of the Overlook, most of them too trivial or too damaged to be of any historical value. But there is one thing that she wants to show me. It's a dog tag. Rangers found it in the ashes. Engraved in this little metal octagon tag are the words Property of H. Derwent. And as far as we know, Harry never owned a pet. After that night, Roger, the man dressed as a dog, is never seen from or heard from again. By the 1950s, Derwent had invested in several casinos, strengthening his ties to the Mafia. In 1954, Derwent sold the hotel to the California Land Development Corporation. From there, as the hotel switched from one owner to the next, the business continued to fail. In 1961, the hotel was purchased by a group of writers who attempted to turn it into a writer's retreat. The poor business venture culminated in tragedy. An aspiring young writer with no previous history of mental illness crashed through a window on the second story and died from the fall. At first, the instructors thought that the young man had left a suicide note on the desk before jumping through the window, but the words were written on a torn page from a journal dated 1934. The words read, Dear Tommy, I can't think up here as well as I'd hoped. I've had strange dreams about things going bump in the night. These words were not written in the dead man's handwriting, and no one in the writer's retreat was named Tommy. This was not the first death to occur at the Overlook Hotel, but it was one of the strangest. If you ask the old-timers in the Sidewinder Cafe, they will tell you that a year never went by without the Overlook claiming at least one life. Yep, that's what I believe. This is Kurt Terwilliger, a lifelong Sidewinder resident. I spend most of my days sitting around here telling tall tales. About half of them are true. But he claims to be dead serious when the Overlook comes up in conversation. Oh, no, I, do, I don't joke. Oh, I don't joke about that, no, sir. Uh, as long as that building is stood up on top of that mountain, that hotel would take at least one life per year. So it sounds like you believe the hotel is cursed, or... Actually, it sounds like you believe the hotel is, or was, alive. Well, it's dead now, thank the Lord. The old-timers fall into four different camps when it comes to the Overlook. The first camp are the skeptics. They believe that any talk of a curse is pure nonsense. But the majority of the old men who sit at this counter belong to camp number two. They believe that the hotel was haunted by ghosts of the people who had died there, and that every once in a while those restless spirits chose another victim. Camp number three is one of the most interesting ones to me. They believe that the hotel was evil, that a sinister presence lurked within the foundation itself. And when I hear this explanation from them, I'm reminded of that eerie sensation that I experienced on the platform, that feeling of being watched. Camp number four is a belief held by only one resident at the cafe. He didn't want his voice recorded, but he did passionately explain that the Overlook had been part of the land of the Cheyenne. He explained, and I'm quoting him, the land up there was sacred to them. I believe the spirits of the Cheyenne people are within the mountains, and anything a white man builds there will be as venomous as a sidewinder snake. By the 1960s, many of the hotel guests were mafia bosses, Vegas tycoons, and hitmen. Some of the more infamous guests included Charles Baby Charlie Battaglia, 
who was tried but acquitted for the gangland-style murder of Jack Duchy Morgan. Richard Scarn, maker of Funtime slot machines, who did a stretch of time in the 1940s for assault with a deadly weapon. Papa Zeiss, a Miami-based importer whose rap sheet includes charges of tax fraud, concealing stolen property, and accessory to murder. And then there is Vittorio Ginelli, also known as Vito the Chopper. Although he had been tried by the courts more than a dozen times, he was only ever convicted of a single crime, shoplifting. However, Vito's luck ran out in June 1966 in the presidential suite of the Overlook Hotel. Gunshots blared through the hallway. Two men, their faces hidden by stockings, ran down the fire escape, driving away in a convertible. The state trooper who arrived on the scene discovered the bodies of three men. It was Vito and his bodyguards. Blood splattered everywhere. And according to the coroner's report, the men not only killed Vito, but they removed his testicles, keeping them as a grotesque trophy. The gang-style murders were the most public of homicides to take place at the Overlook, but unfortunately, they weren't the last. In the late 1960s, the hotel switched owners one last time. A new board of directors led by businessman Albert Shockley restored and revitalized the Overlook. The former glory of the resort had been resurrected and vacationers began to return in droves. The new owners almost made a profit. Still, there was the problem of the winters. There could be no guests for months at a time, and there was also a mechanical issue. The boiler equipment was so antiquated that there was no automatic mechanism in place to release the pressure. That meant to prevent an explosion in the boiler room, the Overlook needed a caretaker 24-7 even during the winter months. In 1970, the person chosen for the job of lone caretaker was a man named Delbert Grady. Yeah, I knew Grady. This is Kurt back at the cafe. Yeah, you, you'd see him at the tavern about every Friday night. He, he loved beer. Grady had a wife and two daughters, ages 8 and 10. The girls looked so much alike, they were often mistaken as twins. Grady's employment history is spotted before taking the job at the Overlook. It seems he was a jack of all trades, but a master of none. And that drinking may have prevented him from holding down a job longer than six months at a time. Hey, I think he was looking forward to his time up there in the mountain. He, he was excited. He was. He, he was said he was going to get paid to spend all that time sitting on his brains and, and spending time with his family. Instead of quiet, tranquil family time, it is believed that Delbert Grady succumbed to an extreme case of cabin fever, exacerbated by large quantities of liquor. Months later, a ranger from the National Park Services discovered the bodies. The Grady sisters had been killed with an axe. Forensic evidence suggests they were the first victims, then after a brief chase, Grady killed his wife with a shotgun and then turned the barrel on himself. As to what triggered this senseless tragedy, the townsfolk of Sidewinder can only guess. The local paper, the Sidewinder Gazette, labeled it a sad but simple case of domestic violence. During my research, I did find one detail from the crime scene reports, something that didn't make the papers. Alexia, the eldest Grady sister, was found holding a book of matches. I'm not sure what to make of it, but I can't help but wonder if the child was doing something that upset Delbert Grady. Attempting to smoke a cigarette or simply playing with matches? And perhaps that's what made the man snap in his intoxicated rage. Oh, he loved his beer, that is for certain, but he was one of them happy drunks. 
Not a sad or angry sort of drunk, just always in a good mood. Most of the other deaths which took place at the Overlook are of a more mundane variety. Natural causes, accidents mostly. Over the years, there have been heart attacks, such as the one that took place on the Roque Court in the 1950s. And there was once a child that had a fatal seizure on the playground. But before the hotel's fiery demise, there are several deaths which don't seem natural or accidental at all. During the last season of The Overlook, the hotel finally broke even. It no longer seemed like a den of iniquity, no longer a debaucherous playground for gangsters and their malls. The Overlook, despite the tragedy of the Grady family, was now attracting the elite upper class, lovers of luxury and sublime wilderness views from the comfort of the opulent dining room. One of these elite members of society was Mrs. Lorraine Massey, who was, according to rumor, an adulteress with a penchant for handsome bellhops and dry martinis. She was a frequent guest at the Overlook. Despite being married to a high-profile attorney in New York, Mrs. Massey rarely stayed with her husband and instead vacationed at the resort either by herself or with a male companion usually one or two decades younger than herself. During her final stay, Massey spent over a week with an unknown young man. Each night they would dance in the Colorado room and drink mass quantities of alcohol until one night the young man left without saying goodbye and he stole her sports car as well. For hours, Lorraine Massey waited for her lover to return, sitting by herself in the dining room refusing to order until her companion returned. He never did. And so Mrs. Massey took the elevator up to her bedchambers in room 217. She swallowed a lethal amount of sleeping pills, crept into a warm bath, and died. But that wasn't the last appearance of Mrs. Massey, at least according to Dolores Vickery. She was one of the maids who claimed to see the ghost of Mrs. Massey. The maid described seeing Lorraine Massey in the bathroom of 217, arms stretched out like a zombie. This spectral vision occurred months after Lorraine's death. Miss Vickery, the maid, had been very public about having a bad feeling about room 217. On the day she allegedly saw the ghost, Dolores was so hysterical that the manager fired her that day hoping to quell any rumors before they could spread. Dolores Vickery wasn't the only one to claim that there were ghosts drifting about the grounds of the Overlook. Oh, yeah. People come in with all sorts of crazy stories. It sounds like you don't believe in the ghosts of the Overlook. I believe in a lot of things, but not that. So do you think people are just making things up? My theory is that all these sightings are actually hallucinations induced by the altitude. This does make a certain amount of sense. Hallucinations are common in Machu Picchu. The tourists who visit that high-altitude spot in Peru often claim to have strange and wild visions. And this might explain what happened to the last victim of the Overlook, Jack Torrance. He was the caretaker hired the winter following the Grady murders. Torrance apparently was not well trained in the operation of the boiler because it blew up, and Torrance blew up along with it, subsequently burning down the entire Overlook Hotel. This, by the way, is where the story gets personal. Full disclosure, I knew Mr. Torrance. He was my English teacher when I attended a private school, Stovington Academy. He was a horrible teacher, and from what I can gather and my observations, he was kind of a horrible person. But of course, between the two of us, I'm the only one who's alive, so, and I'm very biased, so keep that in mind as I tell you my side of things. Mr. Torrance doesn't have the luxury of speaking anymore, so you can't hear it from him. But here's the deal. It was well known that Mr. Torrance had a drinking problem. Personally, I never saw him teach a class while drunk, 
but he often seemed hungover. He was only there a few years, and then he got fired. And the reason he got fired from Stovington was because he beat the shit out of me. Here's what happened. I had signed up for the debate team, and I didn't really want to do it at first, but my uh, dad said that I, if I wanted to go to a decent college, then I needed more extracurricular activities. And it turned out that I liked debate. Even Mr. Torrance, at least at first, said that I had a knack for, for research. And at first, debate practice was fun, but then I started to notice that every time it was my turn to speak, I felt just really rushed. And the timer would go off a lot sooner than I expected. We had four minutes, four full minutes to make our case, and it seemed like I had maybe two and a half minutes. I thought it was just me being nervous, but one of my friends suggested that it was something else. Basically, my friend told me that he didn't think Mr. Torrance liked me and that it looked like Mr. Torrance was cutting my time short on purpose. So during my next speech, I timed myself and sure enough, Mr. Torrance had rung my buzzer a full minute 30 seconds too early. So I confronted him after class and he firmly denied tampering with the timer and I could tell he was upset. And then he told me that I couldn't be on the team anymore. And the reason I couldn't be on the team anymore was that I had a stutter that was holding me back. So here's the thing that infuriates me so much. I don't have a stutter. Even during high school, I have never had a stutter. But Mr. Torrance was so adamant about it, I started to second guess myself. And I spent, you know, a day wondering, it's like, do I have a stutter? Am I in denial? Am I stuttering right now and not hearing it? So I asked my friends, I asked, I even asked my French teacher whom I trusted and everyone told me, no, no, we'd never heard a stutter from you before, but it didn't matter. I was off the team. Now, for anyone still listening to this, I don't want you to think that I am the defenseless victim in the story because I'm not. I was pissed off and I was 16 years old at the time and I did something very stupid. After class, one day, this is about a week after getting kicked off the team, I brought a knife to school and I popped the tires on Mr. Torrance's crappy little Vita bug which was stupid of me, and not just because it was petty and childish, um, but it was very stupid of me because I got caught. Right as I was finishing his last tire, guess who walks out to the parking lot? Mr. Torrance. And I will never forget what he said to me. He said, all right, George, if that's how you want it, come here and take your medicine. And that's when he punched me in the face. After that, I do not remember very much. Miss Strong, that was my French teacher, who probably saved my life that day, ran out and stopped Mr. Torrance. Apparently, even though I, I was already unconscious, he was bashing my head against the fender of his VW bug. So now you know, dear listener, why this story is personal for me. My painful experience makes me wonder what life was like for the Torrances. What did Jack Torrance's wife and young son go through? Was he abusive to them? I remember as a student hearing rumors that he broke his little boy's arm, and his son Danny must have been only three or four, maybe five at the time. But again, this was the 70s. There's no police report to back this up. So what I'm telling you is schoolyard gossip. I do know that Wendy Torrance and Danny Torrance survived the blast of the Overlook Hotel. Wendy Torrance died of lung cancer back in the early 2000s. And Danny Torrance is still alive. He is working in hospice care. I reached out to him for this podcast and unsurprisingly, he did not want to comment upon his father or the Overlook, and for that I do not blame him at all. I hope my instinct is wrong on this. I hope that Mr. Torrance 
was kinder to his family than he was to his students. I hope that during those few months as caretaker at the Overlook, he and his loved ones felt safe and warm and happy. All right, it's about time to say goodbye. I'm in the gift shop of the Overlook Lodge. There are postcards, t-shirts, a snow globe with a plastic miniature replica of the Overlook, made in China. Even now, long after the hotel's destruction, Stories, strange and mysterious, still bubble up from the ground here. People on Reddit are convinced that through the early 2000s, this location was populated by vampires in RVs. A young artist named Andrew Palmeroy disappeared in the 1980s, and his mutilated remains were found in the ashes of the Overlook. State police strongly believe that serial killer Annie Wilkes was responsible. An ex-Marine turned hitman named Billy Summers spent time out here hiding in a cabin, supposedly while working on his autobiography. I think it's time for me to pick out a postcard and leave. All right, I'm crossing the parking lot now, ready to say goodbye to this strange resort I get the feeling I'm not welcome anymore, and... Come and take your medicine. I... That was... I don't like this. I'm... I'm literally the only car here in the parking lot now. The sun is about to set, and even though I don't b b believe in ghosts, I'm going to get off this mountain bef 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 before darkness sets in. So thank you, as always, for listening to Strange Resort.